I'm Marius Robinson, and yes, I'm going to just say a few extra words about how pleased I am to be able to introduce Dr. Karen Koffler. She's so unusual, and we are very fortunate that she has moved closer to us since the last time we had her here, and she's now at the University of Miami in a very important position there. And the wonderful thing about the few people in the world who have a background like uh, Karen Koffler does is that she, she went primarily for a conventional med medical education and then after a while of practicing that she realized that she needed a lot more because she wanted to be able to treat the whole person and not get stuck in you know, the, the, the medical establishment way of doing things. So it's a great pleasure to have you back again, Karen, and we hope you all get a great deal out of this uh, talk tonight. Thank you very much. So Dr. Koffler has been trained um, in Western medicine. Uh, she has her medical degree from the University of Miami. Uh, she studied internal medicine at Chicago and University of Colorado, correct me if I'm wrong, and was one of the first physicians, oh Johnny, come up here, my mom, my mom, and she brought a friend. Um, she was one of the first physicians to study a nurse, Dr. Weil. Does everybody know who Dr. Weil is? Yes. So, um, she's my doctor. And um, I hope that you all learn a lot tonight. I'm going to turn it over to Marius to tell you why we do this, why we try to bring um, great doctors and great information to you and what we hope you will learn. Thank you very much, Melissa. And good evening, everybody. Nice to meet you. And I just uh, wanted to say a few additional words about why we're so proud and delighted to have Dr. Okay. There's a tremendous amount of information in the integrated field, and it's, it's really impossible to, to know it all, I think. But uh, all the people that we've met uh, in, uh, in working together with Melissa for what, three years now on this uh, many seminars, uh, it's, it's just amazing. Sorry, back again because she knows more about these two fields than anybody that I've ever met or perhaps anybody that I hope to meet. And it's wonderful that she is now at closer to us than she was before. Uh, and she's now at the University of Miami in charge of their uh, expanded uh, integrative health thing under the under the Bernie Ocean. So, welcome, Dr. Thank you. There is so much information, and we're going to cover it all tonight. So, if I see anyone nodding off, actually, this is a very difficult time. Did, did you all eat dinner already? Okay, so for those of you who have eaten, that's good. Because you're a little bit starving, that'll keep you away. For those of you who are happy, I'm going to keep my eyes especially on you. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about the brain, and we're going to do a tour because the brain is incredibly interesting, and I think we take it for granted. So, unfortunately, I've got to sort of go back and forth. But so, so what I want to help you do tonight is to appreciate the brain from a different perspective than, than how you may think of it right now, and understand how challenging it is, um, the diseases that we wrestle with from a Western standpoint, a conventional medicine standpoint, to actually correct it. I think the lens by which we've been using, i.e. a pharmaceutical approach, is misguided. I think it's misguided in a number of health issues, but especially when it comes to brain health. And then help you uh, cultivate some tools. I'm cut out again as a way to help you understand what's going on here. As a fetus, prior to birth, a trillion, a trillion neurons are being produced. And in fact, in the last 
month or so of, of being in utero, they're being produced at 250,000 connections per second. That's what's happening when we're carrying our children. And then about 100 billion end up remaining. Neurons being that sort of wad of tissue there you see in the bottom right corner with the extensions, the axons, and the connections that exist between other nerve cells. Um, as we age, we, sh we lose some reaction time, about 10 milliseconds uh, per decade of life. So there are very few activities. Actually, I think I once mentioned that race car driving, or someone brought up something about race car driving, drivers who really depend on reaction time. That's one exception. Uh, otherwise, we are slowly losing capacity. Does anybody know the average age of a NASCAR race car driver? 20, 23? Someone said 30? Good job. Anybody else? 39, right? So, so they're able to retain it a little bit longer. We tend to become, as I said, a little bit slower in our reaction time especially when it comes to things like judging distances. So um, a common thing that we'll see in, in our offices is just a misstep, didn't see the curve, and a misstep that causes us to tumble. Mild cognitive impairment, we use the term MCI in medicine, is, is in fact a loss of brain speed, and 100% of us experience it and will experience it. Um, and very often, patients are coming to me in their 40s, and some even in their 30s these days, complaining of it. So, um, going back to babies, um, when babies are tiny, between ages one and three, they have about twice the number of neurons. Re recall that we started with trillions, we came down to billions, versus adults. And what we now know is there's a faster loss of both nerve cells and their connections if a baby isn't cuddled, if it isn't nourished properly, if it isn't loved well. Um, and for people who feel like they can remember uh, things when they're extremely young, we think that memory storage actually begins as early as age two. Is anybody here able to remember back that young? Once in a while, we do find that's amazing. And then we get to the adolescent brain, and I love this quote, and anybody who's got an adolescent will appreciate this. All anybody expects of an adolescent is that he acts like an adult and be satisfied with being treated like a child. Really accurate. Um, there's a burst of connections. That is the relationship between nerve cells reach out and touch one another a great deal more between the ages of 6 and 12, which is why learning a language before the age 12 is so much easier than later on. And then, as we start moving through schooling, we start pruning down those things that we aren't using. And so we retain strong connections between nerve cells that are used consistently. We develop deep tracks there, and we prune away the things that we have not been using. So, who played piano as a child? Me. All right. All right. Now you can't answer this next one because you're a good job, little guy. Do you? Who are of those who raise your hand? Who's still playing the piano? No. You are. You are not. No, I switched instruments. You switched yeah. instruments. Now, if you sat down in front of the piano, you would do a heck of a lot better than I would because I never played the piano. That's right. Because the tracks are still there, but it would take you work, and you'd probably get a little frustrated right. because it wouldn't flow as easily as it did when you were a child. The more you practice something, the richer the connections that we create. So learning something new, and this is very important to remember, learning something new increases neuronal density, meaning you build more baby brain cells by learning something new. And practicing deepens the connections between nerve cells, which is why even though it might be painful, we want to keep doing it. Okay. The white matter being those connections. Um, the other interesting thing about adolescence is growth begins in the rear of the brain and moves forward. So one of the most important areas, that is the judgment center, is known as the prefrontal cortex, and that's towards the front. 
So when our teenagers make really jerky decisions that are potentially life-threatening, it's because their executive center, that part that gets all the information from the rest of the brain and combines it with a bit of experience to render a decision, it isn't online. It isn't working as well. And in fact, in men, it develops a little bit later than in women. So in women, that executive center comes on in the early 20s. In men, it's like 50. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I really hope it's like, no, I'm sorry. So I'm kidding. But it is later. And you do see riskier behavior in men, typically, than you often see in young men, than you often see in, in women. Now, as we get older, what we consider to be sort of normal is that there's about a 10% volume loss over time. And interestingly, men tend to lose a little bit more in the language area of the brain as opposed to women. Women do experience a significant drop in brain weight when they go through menopause. So very often I hear women complaining of this sort of fogginess, this brain fog, as estrogen and progesterone begin to, to decline. That's a very real phenomenon. Not every woman experiences it. There's a lot of other things that contribute to that. But there's a definite physical change that happens. We get a little bit less efficient at retrieving information. And I would argue it's because, <laughs> it's because you have so much stuff in there. So you may remember you know, a restaurant that you ate at, and you can't remember the name of it, but you remember it was located next to that really cute store where they had that gorgeous sweater that you thought about getting. But then when you thought about it, and you saw it. And you can remember all these other things, and you're making this sort of circuitous route to grab that information and remember the name. Uh, now, the bad news is about a third of us uh, over the age of 70 will have memory issues that, that impair day-to-day -day life without, even, without being given the diagnosis. On the flip side, we tend to develop a good word, a good name for, for the changes that we see as we age, is wisdom. We actually develop a richer um, uh, emotional landscape as we get older. Um, our moral decision-making for hopefully all of us, but at least many of us, uh, becomes richer. Um, we're able to read social situations better than when we're younger. And in, in many studies, they see that we get better at remembering positive experiences, and we lose some of the memory for negative experiences, which is interesting. Now, you probably can tell that I like talking about the difference between men and women. Um, and in women, the corpus callosum, which is that part of the brain that connects the two hemispheres, is denser than in men. And I like to use this example. Um, when, uh, when my husband and I were first married and we were living in an apartment, I watched him need something from the second floor. And I watched him get up off the couch, go to the second floor, get that one item, and come back downstairs. And I remember looking at that incredulously because at the bottom of the stairs was a laundry basket. And I thought if that was me, I would have brought the laundry upstairs, started putting it away, get distracted by something in the corner that I saw, picked up a little bit of lint, wiped down the bathroom, and then come back downstairs without remembering that I went upstairs for a specific object. So that has something to do with all the connections that exist between the right and left hemisphere. Um, men tend to have larger areas of their brain that talks about, that, that is devoted to spatial relationship. So while I don't like to admit it, very often men are, are seen to have a better sense of direction. Um, and when they do tell direction, they tend to tell it in terms of vectors, east, west, north, south. Women tend to do things more like near, you know, make a left at the gas station, then you're gonna see a green house. So landmarks more like that. Men think a little bit uh, more in terms of um, measurement. Okay. When it comes to um, diagnoses, women tend to be diagnosed more, more often with anxiety and depression. But I can't really tell whether or not that's just the, uh, 
due to the fact that women tend to access help a lot easier or a lot more frequently or, or um, it's not unnatural perhaps for many women to, to reach out for help. Um, men are more often diagnosed with autism or uh, Tourette's uh, dyslexia and schizophrenia. So there is a sexual um, uh, difference between men and women with regards to that. Uh, with ADHD, girls tend to show more inattention, boys tend to show more impulse control. I'm going to move past that because we have a fair amount to cover, but I think it's interesting to note that the brain changes over time um, and that there are differences between men and women, and we're going to come back to all of this as we go on in the talk. So one of the things that we're most concerned about, in fact, we are now more concerned about losing brain function than we are about being given a diagnosis of cancer. Um, so here you go. My memory is so bad. How bad is it? <laughs> How bad is what? Um, that's pretty bad. Um, and so when we forget uh, facts, when we begin to forget facts, and we're at a certain age, we actually become concerned that this could be early onset of something worrisome. And if we have a family history of anything like that, that's even more worrisome. Um, some re researchers feel that one of the reasons why, as adults, we might not be as efficient at retrieving information is simply that we haven't trained our attention and that we're processing so much information that it, we're, not, we're not allowing to register uh, an event as fully as we ideally should. And that it isn't so much that there's something structurally wrong, it's how we're using our brain. One of the people that I've trained with is Rudy Tanzi, arguably one of the world's greatest researchers on Alzheimer's disease. He runs a, a network of researchers that is international. Um, and he says, you spend your whole life, decades and decades, accumulating memories and association you develop a personality of who you are based on your experience and memories. And this disease, Alzheimer's, comes in and rips all that right out. So it literally steals who you are from you. And having been working with patients over the last several years um, with, uh, with memory loss and, and Alzheimer's type dementia primarily, um, he's absolutely right. Families are, are obviously uh, very much affected by, by the, a loved one with that diagnosis. Currently, there's about 30 million people with Alzheimer's disease. By 2050, it's projected to be 160 million. So is, is that worldwide or US? This is worldwide, with the US sort of leading that curve. Really. Um, currently, one in nine over the age of 85, but by uh, down the road, 50 per, well, we're headed towards 50% of us developing dementia by the age of 85, so it's a huge number. And, um, and not, it should be understood that not all forgetting that happens is actually due to Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is one type of dementia, and probably the most, and certainly the most common type, but other things can contribute to it. You may remember Robin Williams had a uh, diagnosis of Lewy body, which appears differently from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, traumatic brain injury occupies a small piece, um, but then stroke and, and uh, other conditions like that contribute significantly, and that's more preventable, or, or preventable as much as Alzheimer's may well be preventable. So um, an important feature to remember is that um, it's not just about forgetfulness when it comes to Alzheimer's. There also has to be some other additional um, behavioral problems. So for instance, um, placing, the co placing um, an object into the refrigerator, which I have actually done before. Um, and I don't know if anybody else has done where you're just not paying attention and you're sort of on autopilot. But having that happen over and over, looking at the microwave and suddenly not having any idea how to operate it, um, those are more common findings. Uh, difficulty following a conversation. Now, the important thing about that, because I've seen that happen uh, before with patients, is hearing may be contributing to that. 
And what I've often seen is people are loath to get hearing aids. They don't like how they fit. They're not comfortable. They, they cause them other problems. So they don't augment their hearing, and they begin to withdraw from conversation that way, which has an impact on, the, on brain function. Altered coordination, so really misjudging distances, reaching for something and, and completely missing it, um, or a difficulty performing routine tasks that, that a person would normally be able to do. The other big piece is new learning is impaired, because that's what Alzheimer's has to do with. You generally preserve older memories, you have a difficult time creating new ones. When we look at uh, brain scans of patients who have this diagnosis, you can see a significant reduction in volume. The dark area in the center are, is the area that houses the cerebral sp spinal fluid called the ventricle. And that area seems to expand because the actual brain tissue itself appears to be shrinking. When we look at these brains at autopsy, what we find are two very pathognomonic features. One is neurofibrillary tangles, which are wads of protein that are inside the brain cell itself. And the other one, which has been often the target of pharmaceutical drugs, are called amyloid plaques, which is also a wad of protein that the cell seems to be pushing out of itself in response to something. And that breaks up the connections between nerve cells. So those two features are what we would uh, look for in someone who's got Alzheimer's. And these are the two people that you will continue to hear a lot about if you haven't already. <coughs> Dale Bredesen's book came out recently called The End of Alzheimer's. Uh, Rudy Tanzi, who I mentioned earlier. These two gentlemen are really pushing the envelope of, of how we've been approaching brain health uh, up until this point. And, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, our misguided attempt to try, try to find a drug that will reverse what I just showed you has resulted in 243 out of 244 drugs completely failing at that. Um, according to uh, Dale Bredesen, uh, the most effective drug, the only drug that would be able to reverse dementia would be able to do all of these things that I have listed here. So there'll never be a medication, as far as I can tell, that's going to be able to undo the insult that happens that causes memory loss and causes diseases like dementia. Which is why Dale Bredesen is making such a big splash. So if you're interested in brain health, it's not a light read, I would tell you that. But the end of Alzheimer's really gives us insight into an approach to helping the brain that quite honestly we've been using in, in functional medicine to help reverse heart disease, to help reverse diabetes, to help reverse arthritis. And it turns out it's all the same process but affecting the brain. So when we see neurodegeneration as functional medicine and integrative medicine doctors, we're using some of the same concepts that we use to help our patients with a whole host of other diagnoses. And what this slide is showing us is that different environmental exposures, coupled with your unique biochemistry, your unique genetic uh, dis predisposition, have an impact on your health. So for instance, there is a gene associated with the development of Alzheimer's. It's called the ApoE4 gene. If you inherited one copy from your parent, you have a, about a 30% increased rate of developing dementia. If you inherited two copies, you have about 10 times the risk. You don't have 100 times the risk. You don't have, you are not guaranteed to be developing dementia. In fact, of all the genetically, re, genetically related diseases, 95% of them are unrelated to, or, or will never be expressed, even though you have the gene. Another way of saying that is, if you have inherited a tendency for a disease, only 5% of those diseases are going to manifest. 
That means 95% of uh, a genetically based disease does not necessarily have to manifest in a person. Do you follow the significance of that? That's an important concept. That means there's something else way beyond your genes that's affecting the development of disease. And that something else is environment and lifestyle. So, sorry, I have a question. So when they say something generic, that's, so that doesn't necessarily mean that it's only the 95% of your body will actually. That's right. So for instance, there's a disease called Huntington's chorea. Has anybody ever heard of that? In about your 40s or 50s, you begin to develop these, these um, chorea form movements that are involuntary. You just start moving. It's a, it's a neurodegenerative disorder. If you have the gene, as far as we know right now, you develop the disease. But very, very, very few other diseases will manifest whether, if, even if you have the, the gene. So yes, what you're saying is exactly accurate. All right, so here's how we like to approach brain health. And honestly, I could be talking about almost any other health condition right now because it's all the same general approach with a little bit of tweaking. So it involves food, movement, stress management, um, meaning, and when it comes to brain health, learning. When I'm sitting with patients who are concerned about their brain, there are certain testing that I do. I do do the genetic testing so we have a sense of where we are. Um, I want to listen for toxic exposures. I want to know if there's been a history of brain trauma, um, what infections they've been exposed to, any evidence of inflammation. Inflammation is the driver of most of the diseases that we see. Um, if they've had a history of mood disorders, uh, what nutrients they may, might be lacking in for them. So for instance, vegetarians, I tend to be a vegetarian myself, will have a tendency to be lower in B12, and a low B12 has an impact on the nervous system. We explore their hormones to make sure those are optimized, and then we talk about other lifestyle issues. Now there are things that we do inadvertently every day that contribute to injury of, of the human body. So alcohol, which I am not against, but uh, a serious night out of drinking will cause you to lose about 60,000 nerve cells. I try to tell that to my kids, which, and they listen, thankfully. I tell them these scientific facts. They've been hearing it since they were seven years old. Um, hopefully that will help them avoid these experiences. Medications that we tend to use, and some people statin medications are harmful, and some people it actually can be beneficial. We're going to go into that a little bit more in just a moment. Um, heart disease, coronary artery disease, or blocking uh, or a narrowing of the blood vessels that lead to the heart, the same process is going on in the brain. It's not limited to just the heart. It's happening all over the body. And the brain obviously is very exquisitely sensitive to adequate blood flow. So coronary artery disease, to me, I'm going to also be worrying about the person's brain. Absence of stimulating partner or environment. Isn't that interesting? If someone is living in a situation, let's take, for example, nursing homes. Most nursing homes are not terribly stimulating, or many are not terribly stimulating, I should say. Um, that actually has a negative impact on the brain. The brain likes to be stimulated. So for instance, remember how I said about hearing loss? If you withdraw that sense, your hearing is not as acute. And in response to that, you simply don't attend. You're actually hurting your own brain because you're depriving it of that stimulus. An inflexible personality style. Isn't that interesting? So studies have been done. The more rigid a person is, the more likely they are to develop dementia. The more fluid and flexible the laid back ones among us tend to do better from a brain health standpoint. So I remember when I was young, anybody remember watching Willard Scott, who used to do the weather, right? And Willard Scott, before he did the weather, he'd say, like, Bessie May is 104 years old today. And I remember even as a kid watching that, and, and the person he would sort of do an expose on, a brief expose on, 
was never like a Fortune 500 hard driving CEO. It was always like somebody laid back. And when you asked her about her secret to living long, she'd say something like, you know, I take a swig of whiskey and drink a cigar, you know, and have a cigar every day, right? So it, being more laid back and free flowing actually is better for your brain than being more rigid. Inactivity, we'll talk more about high blood pressure. There are new guidelines around blood pressure. We want to see you no higher than 130-ish for the top number, no higher than 80-ish for the bottom number. It used to be 140 over 90. Please be sure you know your blood pressure. That's an important vital sign for you all to be aware of. Um, malnutrition, depression, diabetes for, for um, diabetes is sort of like creating a sugar coating over your tissues, which causes injury to the tissue below and, and results in an inflammatory cascade. Um, smoking and, of course, stress. So let's, do a, let's go over some of the lifestyle um, uh, things that you can do, you can focus on. This um, pyramid, this food pyramid on your right, was concocted by Dr. Weil, who, who's probably the father of integrative medicine. And, and the food pyramid that the government has put out is actually woefully inaccurate. Um, this is a much more accurate way of understanding. And the reason why it flares at the bottom is because that should be the majority of what you're eating. So if you look at your plate, and at least half of it is uh, a plant, veggies, to a lesser extent fruit, fruit um, you're probably doing a pretty good job already. Uh, but the other things that we really focus on, especially when it comes to brain health, is reducing the amount of carbs. We just take in too many carbs. And while a ketogenic diet, which who, who came to the lecture uh, by great, um, recently you all had a lecture on the ketogenic diet, fantastic diet, you have to work your way towards it if, you're, if you've had carbohydrates in your diet. Um, but we know that the brain really likes to be more in a ketogenic state, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. We have people avoid gluten. Now, I've waffled a lot on this whole gluten thing, because I can't believe that wheat, which has been in our diet for a pretty long time, is now suddenly such a toxic thing. However, there are a few reasons we think that wheat is problematic for many of us, if not most of us. There are some studies that suggest that every time you eat wheat, there's a little bit of low-grade inflammation that happens in the lining of your gut. Um, so in someone who's worried about their brain, we have them take gluten out of their diet. Remember what I said about sugar. Um, Sugar, it, there's a specific biochemical reaction that happens when we um, have a lot of sugar in our diet. It's not just refined sugar, as you can see here. An important set of numbers for you to get every time you go to the doctor. Typically do your fasting blood sugar, but that's not actually enough. I want you to all to make sure you're asking your doc for a fasting insulin level. That is a more accurate uh, that gives me a more accurate picture of how well you handle your own sugar. And you want that fasting insulin level to be at least below four, because you could have what looks like a sort of normal fasting blood sugar, which by the way should be 90 or lower. So for those of you who have labs at home, and everybody should always get a copy of their own labs, make sure your fasting blood sugar is 90 or lower. There are some great alternatives to using sugar, for instance, some of my patients say the only sugar that I take in is in my coffee in the morning. Xylitol, stevia, or erythritol are, are reasonable substitutions for that. But realize this too, if you get off of all sugar, in two weeks you have totally new taste buds, and the next time you get exposed to sugar, you're gonna find it entirely too sweet. So that's just a little tip. Okay, I'm gonna skip through some of these studies. Uh, this is uh, David Perlmutter. Anybody familiar with David Perlmutter? He used to practice over in, in Naples. Uh, he also used to lecture here with us at the University of Miami. 
Um, he's one of the first uh, people who began to write about the negative impact on brains and brain function and the creation of inflammation and how it has a unique impact on the brain as well as the gut lining. So grain brain is a, is a very good treatise on that. Now, omega-3s, who's taking omega-3s as a supplement, right? So there was a recent study that came out that showed that omega-3s are worthless, and then there was another study that came out that showed that omega-3s are fantastic. I suspect that omega-3s, when taken in the diet, are much more effective, because when they do some of these studies, omega-3s actually need fat to be well absorbed. So if you're taking omega-3 supplements, make sure you're taking it with a fatty meal. We know that if you have low levels of DHA, DHA is one of the omega-3s that we uh, pay particular attention to, that that predisposes you uh, to the development of dementia. Um, we don't know that if we supplement you with DHA, however, that we're going to reverse it, but it is one of the things that we use. We do recommend that people, especially if fish is already in your diet, favor those fish that tend to be higher in omega-3. So that would include salmon, herring, anchovies, if you can stomach anchovies. Sardines are probably one of the most perfect foods you can eat if you can stomach those. Um, on that list is also tuna, but I want you to be careful of that, and I'll show you a slide in just a moment, which is the safest tuna out there. Uh, but there are other uh, plant sources of omega-3s. They include the nuts that you're probably familiar with. And isn't it interesting how much like a brain the walnut looks? I'm just saying. It's sort of an interesting find. And chia seeds, which are very, very easy to integrate into your diet. Chia seeds have omega-3s. They're also fabulous and for fiber, uh, easy to add to salads or to uh, smoothies. Um, if you were at the lecture a couple of weeks ago, you'll have learned about MCT and coconut oil. Who's now using coconut oil, coconut milk, coconut this and coconut that? All right, great. So coconut happens to be, coconut products happen to be higher in saturated fat. And we've taught you all that saturated fat is very bad for you. But when we taught that to you, we didn't understand the differences between uh, the fats that are in saturated fat. We were premature, and in fact, there's a lot of data now that's coming out that's saying this whole saturated fat story is utter nonsense. It was bad science, and I'm so sorry. You can eat your butter and your meat and your bacon. So get ready, because there's going to be a lot more information about that. For who is that upsetting to hear that information that you went without bacon and meat and butter for many years? OK, so it does, so for me, as someone who's generally partial to eating a vegetarian diet, that's like I get a little bit shaken up when I hear that. Um, however, if we're going to be evidence-based, there is a lot of evidence to support the fact that meats are not the horrible thing that we thought they were. How an animal is raised has a big impact on how it affects your physiology. I'm not saying to those of you who have been forsaking meat not to, to, to go out and eat it, but I am saying watch the news for that information. When it comes to coconut, though, it's very rich in a certain kind of fat called MCT, medium chain triglyceride. And when you take that in, and in fact, you can buy just MCT oil. That's probably that's what you're using. Yeah. Um, it immediately gets converted to something called ketones. And you recognize that word from the ketogenic diet. And it's used as brain fuel. In fact, it's used as fuel overall, but the brain really likes using ketones as a fuel source. So we first saw this to be very effective, actually, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Uh, someone realized that people with a seizure disorder, if they were eating, consuming very little food, going, doing fasts intermittently, actually had a reduction in their seizures. Because the body used ketones, it would burn fat and turn that into ketones for fuel. That was the first hint many, 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 many years ago. And more recently, we see that using MCT oil for the treatment of seizures is very effective. The other thing that's very effective uh, surrounding your food is just not eating so much. 
right? So when I started working for Canyon Ranch many years ago, we had a certain plate, we had certain portion sizes that we determined to be the correct adult portion size. And there was an outcry by the people who, attend, who, who came to the restaurant. I don't know if anybody went to, the, to Canyon Ranch in the early years, not Tucson or Lenox, because there you could eat all you wanted. But in Miami, we actually, we actually put the proper size portions on the plates. Anybody by chance eat at Canyon Ranch in Miami Beach? No, well you would have been disappointed because you would have felt like you were being gypped. Because we're used to larger portion sizes in part because we're used to larger plates. Our plate sizes have grown by 30% since about the 1930s. So with larger plates came larger portions. We trained ourselves to eat more. So reversing that and, and eating less um, is not everybody's favorite thing to have to do, but in fact, just that alone, just shaving back the amount of calories that we're taking in actually helps brain function. Anybody experiencing or, or, or um, experimenting with intermittent fasting? Yeah, so intermittent fasting, uh, there are many ways that this could be done, but it's generally speaking shrinking the amount of hours that you take in food. So for instance, if, you, if your last meal was at 8 p.m., then you go until noon the next day. This is weird how that, okay, so noon the next day before you eat again. So on a typical day, so for instance, like today, you would eat lunch at noon, and then you would eat again, the last time you would eat again would be about 8 p.m., and then you would go 16 hours before you have another meal. And actually, we're super well built for we are really well built to not eat all the time. We become much more metabolically efficient and active. We improve our metabolic rate. It helps us lose weight. It's super good for our brain. Uh, it helps lower blood pressure. There's a lot of health benefits to intermittent fasting. And it does not fly in the face of what we taught you, which is breakfast is the most important yeah. meal of the day. So this is how science is, right? One, like on Sunday we tell you one thing, but a week later we tell you, no, 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 forget that. This is actually the right thing to do. It's not easy practicing when the climate changes every other week, but um, this is something that there's a lot of data behind. And what I would say is just try it. Just try, don't try it at 16 hours. Try it at 12 hours, then go to 13 hours, then go to 14 hours, and see how you feel. What I've noticed, and I've never gone without breakfast in my life. Um, this year I started doing intermittent fasting, and what I've noticed is that my, my energy is much better and it's more sustained when I don't eat breakfast and my first meal is at about noon. So if that's important to you, I'd suggest that you give that a shot. So takeaways on the whole food uh, aspect of, of improving brain function. Eat a plant-based diet. You've, all, you've probably heard everybody is speaking about this today. When you look at your plate, at least half of it should be plants. If you can do that pretty consistently, you're doing a good job. I favor organic, although I've entered into many debates about what organic really means in this country, and I can't actually tell you what it really means. Ideally, it's much more nutrient-dense than non-organic. But because the FDA does not do a great job overseeing any of that, I can't guarantee you that. Um, get, get the sugar out of your diet. Um, not an easy thing for those of us who've been addicted, but it's very doable. And remember that you have new taste buds every two weeks. So get, make a plan to get it out right after the holidays, and you'll notice that you don't have the, the urge for it. Um, healthy fats and plenty of them especially for brain health, particularly in the form of avocados, olives, and coconut. Um, and timing is important. Now, as an integrated medicine doc, I have had patients show up to my office with Whole Foods bags worth of supplements that we have to painstakingly go through each ingredient to figure out whether or not it's in the right form. Are they overdoing it? Are they underdoing it? My feeling is food first. You can spend a lot of money on supplements, and I could tell you probably about 30 different supplements to take for brain health. 
and there are studies that support many of them. This is a vitamin E study. Here's a short list of some of the things that we will use with someone who has cognitive impairment. Um, and on that list, probably lion's mane is one of my favorite ones. Um, but I would say to you, some of the other lifestyle behaviors to me are, have had the biggest impact on my patient's well-being than necessarily the supplements. Having said that, there's good evidence behind everything that's listed here. There have been studies associated with. I had mentioned earlier about women and their brains when they go through menopause. When we are looking at people to optimize their function, we look at some of these hormone levels in particular to see where they are and if that's contributing to their decreased brain function. So each one of these plays a role. Um, cortisol and DHEA being more of the stress hormones that we see. Thyroid, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of information about how to optimize your thyroid function now. I think conventional medicine tends to be a little bit conservative. I also think some of my alternative colleagues tend to be a little too aggressive with that and blame a lot of things on thyroid. Um, so that's a person by person thing, but these are some of the levels that we would want to see in our patients. And if this is important to you, you might want to take a photo of that to make sure those, are ta uh, those labs are checked. One of my favorite topics, exercise. So we know that regular exercisers have reduced rates of every significant disease that we tend to die from. And to me, it's non-negotiable. Everybody can work out, can work in movement. Now, we've led you to believe that you have to go to the gym and you have to work out for like 60 minutes. In reality, that's nonsense. If you look at the healthiest societies in the world, they walk. They carry their groceries. In fact, my mother-in-law, who um, doesn't know anything about gyms, lives in a little tiny village in the Middle East, would go to the market. It's called a shuk, but it's a, like an open-air flea market that comes into town once a week. And I remember going with her. Now, they are a little bit at altitude, and I'm not used to that. But I remember, as someone who's been working out in a gym for a lot of years, going, trudging down the hill with her to buy bags of tomatoes, cucumbers, and so forth. So we're loaded down with these bags, and then she spies a watermelon. And I'm thinking, how the heck are we going to get this back up the hill? And because she's been living like this for 70 years, she picks it right up along with everything else and trudges back up the hill. So we, we now go to gyms because there's nothing else that we really do physically. We don't wash our own cars. We don't necessarily mow, mow our own lawns. We're not doing much of the physical labor that we needed to do in order to just live day by day. But I think that's misguided because when I ask my patients about it, they're like, I don't have time to go to the gym. And at the end of the day, if it's been a busy day to first go to the gym when you have other responsibilities, it's not going to happen. So I, my feeling is work it in throughout your day. Work it in. Take a break. Go for, go for a walk. Um, studies show that if you break up your exercise, if you do 10-minute walks here and there, it's as effective as if you did it consistently. And at, just as problematic, by the way, are the people who overtrain. So if we, do, if we run lab tests on people who are working out excessively, they have higher levels of oxidative stress. In fact, one of the worst things I believe you could do for yourself, and my apologies to you marathon runners, is doing a marathon. It's probably one of the single worst things you could do for your body in the long run due to the severe oxidative stress. In fact, we see that if you, if you analyze the heart immediately after a marathon, you see that it's pumping very dysfunctionally. I like this image because on your left is, a, is, a, is uh, the brain of somebody who is just sitting quietly. And on your right is somebody who's gone for a 20-minute walk. And where there's more red, there's more blood flow. So the brain lights up when you go exercise. I used to, before major exams, I used to go for, not a marathon, like a 15-minute run just to get my brain engaged so it can be very, very effective. Uh, 
on a completely different note um, is something that um, that we've become, well, we were aware of when I used to work in the intensive care unit, we used to see this quite a bit. Um, Post-anesthesia, so as we get older, one of the reasons why we worry about surgery is not just complications related to surgery, but complications related to anesthesia. So elective procedures that require general anesthesia, I guide my patients to do the best they can to avoid that because there is a phenomenon postoperatively where they develop, where as we get older, we can develop some cognitive dysfunction. We definitely saw this in patients who underwent bypass. Very often patients who undergo bypass surgery know that their brain is not functioning as well as it was prior to the surgery, and the surgery happened on the heart, not the brain. But bypass cannot, when they bypass the heart, that machine that's circulating the blood does not work exactly like the heart did. And there can be tiny injury, tiny areas of injury to the brain. So along those same lines, other toxic exposures that we worry about is, first of all, remember that the brain is largely fat, and fat tends to house toxins. So therefore, your brain can be a warehouse of toxic exposure. So it's important that we do what we can to not augment that. Some of the ways that we do that inadvertently for some people is mold exposure. So mold is a toxin that can affect some people's brains, particularly people who are genetically predisposed. Plastics, so studies that have been done on rats that showed if you expose them to the BPA and plastics, they have more mood disorders, which is an interesting thing to test in rats. Actually, they show more apathy and depression, and they, are, they can't learn as well. And the other big one that we worry about is mercury. So for those of us who had mercury fillings when we were younger, they're not using it so much anymore, although typically insurance still only covers, many people's insurance still only covers mercury fillings as opposed to other fillings. But mercury has a strong predilection for fat. That's why checking blood levels of mercury is not that helpful, because that mercury has already been sequestered into fat tissue. But that can play a role in, in cognitive impairment. And remember I had mentioned to you about tuna earlier. So the safest tuna to eat is Pacific yellowfin tuna. So some of the Atlantic albacore tuna that many of us grew up on tends to be higher in mercury than Pacific yellowfin. Mercury being a very big fish, it eats a lot of smaller fish and really concentrates the mercury that's now uh, diffused throughout our oceans. I had mentioned to you watch for hearing loss. The other thing is, is a sense of smell. Diminished sense of smell can be an early sign of cognitive impairment. So those are two things that we typically ask our patients about. Anybody know who this is? Um, Arguably the world's greatest quarterback, right? So uh, 41 years old, I think he's won five Super Bowls. If you were to ask him, uh, about his lifestyle, he's going to tell you something very noteworthy. Does anybody know what is his secret? That he, what he feels to be? Tell me. His wife. Yes. His wife. Yeah, it's his wife. That's excellent. He's got a brain diet. He is. TB12. That's right. Yeah, he's what? He has his own diet plan. But that's not what he would say. What, what, do you know what he's going to say? Sleep. Tell us. Yeah, he's real nice. He's going to sleep early. He is in bed at 8.30. He's in bed at 8.30. He feels like that's one of the most important things for his performance. So how many of you all are getting a solid seven to nine hours of sleep a night? One person, honestly, two people? OK. All right, great. But I think the majority of us in this room are not getting a solid night's sleep. So the other way to ask that is, how many of you all feel refreshed when you wake up in the morning, like ready to go without coffee? So two, three, just a handful of those. That is one of, thank you, that's excellent. That is one of the most important lifestyle changes you need to focus on if you do not feel like 
you've got good quality sleep. For adults, that's seven to nine. For kids, that's nine to 12 hours. So why high school starts at 7.15 in the morning is beyond me. But deep sleep, the deepest stages of sleep, there's essentially three stages of sleep, light, deep, and REM. And in deep sleep, not only are you consolidating your memories of the day, but in deep sleep, your brain actually swells and it sort of pulls out the debris of all the metabolic processes of the nerve cells. So it's actually sucking out the garbage that you've created in the day-to-day -day operations of thinking. And it drains it out of the brain. And so if you're not getting adequate deep sleep, which by the way happens, generally speaking, before 3 a.m. So for those of you who like to go to bed very, very late, you're, you're moving into your deep stage. So the best quality of sleep is probably before 2 a.m. As the, as the night goes on, you're in and out of lighter stage uh, of sleep. So that's an, a very important thing to focus on. And many of us have undiagnosed sleep apnea, where we actually stop breathing during the night. You would never know it um, necessarily yourself. More likely, your bed partner would be aware of it. Snoring doesn't mean that you have sleep apnea, but it can be a clue that you might have sleep apnea. Another clue might be early morning headaches, or that you fall asleep easily in the middle of the day. Those are some signs that might tell us that you have sleep apnea. That needs correction. But with regards to stress, in conventional medicine, if you describe anxious symptoms to your doc, very often they're going to be writing out a prescription for one of these medications, Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium in the olden days, uh, but shorter acting medications like Xanax and Ativan. And we now know that use of those medications is linked to an increased risk of dementia. Now, I don't think use of those medications causes dementia. What I think is happening is underlying anxiety that in conventional medicine we treat with a medication is doing nothing to really help the brain, and someone is going to develop dementia as a result of not getting to the root of the problem. So that's a classic example of how we give a medication to get rid of a symptom instead of trying to understand what's driving those symptoms to begin with, which is much harder work, but a much bigger payoff. So the mind and the body are not, you all know this better than perhaps we necessarily behave in, in conventional medicine, but the mind affects the, the body and the body affects the mind. Anybody who's experienced pain can appreciate it's hard to be engaged and empathic when you're living with chronic pain. But there's a whole host of other ways in which we now know that thoughts translate into biochemical reactions that inhibit immune function, that decrease hormonal production. It, your thoughts are not just these amorphous things that are happening in your brain. They are biochemical reactions that affect every single system in the body. Um, and so if you can remember that, if you can appreciate that, and if you can learn how to take a step back and determine whether or not that thought is helping you or hurting you, that will serve you in the long run. And nowhere is that more true than when it comes to the memory center. Uniquely injured by anxious thoughts, the hippocampus, which is the memory center, you will see pretty dramatic cell death in a chronic uh, stressed state. Why that area is injured primarily, we don't know. The good news is as much of that can be recovered because we can hack into our own brains and change things. So this is the whole field of neuroplasticity. This is probably one of the most exciting areas of research in medicine today. And what it tells us is basically your brain looks different with every thought. The structure and the movement and the activity of your brain is different every time you think something. And that thinking and learning actually turn on and off different genes. So probably the folks that have taught us the most in regards to this are people who meditate. Who are the regular meditators here? That's excellent. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, when I first started doing these talks, people thought I was crazy to bring up meditation. One of the best books I think ever written on this is a book called Buddha's Brain, and there's many, many more now. 
but this really reviews what happens in the brains of someone who meditates. If you compare a 50-year-old consistent meditator with somebody who's 50 and has never meditated, the 50-year-old meditator will have more dense brain tissue, more nerve cells, and more connections between nerve cells. Um, they typically describe better capacity for attention and mood and uh, immune function. And um, there's been a number of studies that have do been done. This is one of the uh, ones that I've referred to a lot in the past called Curtin Crea. Has anybody heard of Curtin Crea? Okay, so Curtin Crea is a very specific form of meditation that involves a mudra or moving your fingers, t touching the tips of your fingers, and saying a chant. And the way it goes, just so that you're aware, because if you're interested, this is a great meditation to start with. Oftentimes when I ask patients about meditation, they'll say, oh, I can't meditate. Anybody else have that experience? I can't quiet my mind, right? 100% of us cannot quiet our minds. Only consistent meditators can quiet their minds, right? That's a universal phenomenon. What you're learning how to do is actually train your attention. That's what meditation actually teaches. So when you do Curtin Kriya, it's so active. So you're moving your fingers like this as you sit, and you're saying a chant, sa ta na ma You know it already. You do it. Brilliant. You do it in this building. Right. They have a class here? Right here. What days? Wednesday, Wednesday mornings at 10. Wednesday mornings at 10. Friday, Friday, Wednesday, Friday. And Friday. And as soon as you're done with that meditation, you can go to Marius's Tai Chi, and then you're set. You're set for the week, right? So you all have access to that. That meditation has been studied and has been shown to reverse mild to moderate cognitive impairment. That's how powerful that is far more powerful than any medication that we've ever come up with. Of the 244 meds that we've come up with, a meditation has been shown to be more effective than any of that. So give that a try. You can look that up online. The Alzheimer's Research and Prevention Foundation will send you a CD that you can listen to to begin the practice. Or better yet, you can come here and do it with a group because that's going to be even more powerful. OK. So, remember what I said before, learning something new is really key as we get older. The other thing that we know is, you know, people will sometimes choose as they age to become more shrunken down in their interests. Um, another possibility is that you continue to push forward the boundaries of your own learning. And if you do so, we see in those that we've studied that they tend to retain more brain function and actually even improve function as they get older. So being set in your ways, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, all that is nonsense. The new medicine is keep growing, keep learning, keep pushing the boundary of what you know. The more demanding a task is, the more tissue, the more brain tissue it requires to do it, so a great example of a demanding task, particularly for some of us more than others, is learning to dance, especially with a partner. So learning how to dance with a partner, you're hearing the music, you're interpreting it through your body, and then if you add another body with which you're trying to move in coordination, that's actually pretty challenging to the nervous system. Not only that, in moving and constantly changing direction, especially as we get older, you increase the activity of the nerve cells in the periphery, in the rest of your body, so that it's more responsive to the environment. So expose yourself to demanding tasks. Your mind and body today are the results of your habits yesterday, and your mind and body of tomorrow are the results of the habits you've, had, you've developed for today. And I'm um, happy to answer any questions that you all have. But what thank was you. that mantra again? Sa-ta-na-ma. Sa Wednesdays and Fridays. Class here.
What about those smart drugs that people they are the taking? The nootropics? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. like um, True Niagen? Yeah. Like products yeah, those like that? Things, yeah. There's actually data behind it. None of it is going to be as powerful as everything I just told you about lifestyle. Yeah. But there is actually very good data. Like I said, all the ones that I had listed on there and True Niagen as well, there is data behind it. So if you want like a little bit more of an edge, that could help. I've tried them all. I can't tell you that I'm like, oh, wow, I'm really on fire for that. Yeah, you try it. Yeah. But I have had patients, and we lay out a lot of those for our patients who have dementia. Yeah. Uh -huh. I've been reading a lot about mushrooms, uh, shaga, and lion's mane. You mentioned um, yes, lion's, lion's mane. And um, they have a lot of the market now, those lion, lion's mane and yes. shaga in the, in the coffee. In the coffee. In the coffee. It's a mixture. They don't have sugar. It's just coffee and, and mushrooms. And some of these mushrooms. Yeah. Right, right, right. What do you think? Because you didn't mention at all about coffee. Yeah. How so, does that relate to the brain? Okay, so coffee actually... Who are the coffee drinkers? Who are worried about what I'm about to say? Enjoy your coffee. Get really good quality organic coffee. Some of my colleagues would be like, the first thing you have to do is get off of all coffee. I actually don't think that, because if you look at the data around coffee, it's got a tremendous number of health benefits. As long as you're not abusing it and as long as you're sleeping well, I think coffee is a great food for us to for us to ingest. Mushrooms are a pretty remarkable, not white button mushrooms, but lots of other, including the more exotic mushrooms, have remarkable health benefits, particularly boosting immune function, but also for brain health. Um, I would say cook with them first, um, particularly, again, not white button. There's very little nutritional benefit to white button mushrooms. They're good in fiber. They have some minerals, but there's a lot better, like portobello mushrooms and enoki and shiitake should be a mainstay in your diet, actually. Um, and in terms of supplements, um, I would, I'm would. i going to put a plug in for somebody that I trained with, Paul Stamets, who, um, who has a company called Fungi Perfecta is one of the top mycologists in the world. So you can buy host defense, and they have organically raised mushrooms. Yeah, those yeah. Are great health benefit. So while many of my colleagues will put people on a multivitamin and vitamin D and so forth, generally what I put people on are mushrooms. Yeah. Yes. And then the other uh, slide, it's, it says that gluten and grains actually so what's right, your great question, such a great question. This is where, when we work with patients one-on-one, -on -one, it's different than when we're talking to a large group. So there are some people who feel that grains high in lectins, high in gluten, high in certain molecules are really bad for you. Grains, beans would fall into that category as well. And others that say that's sort of nonsense. It's a very individual thing. If there's evidence of inflammation, let's say somebody has rheumatoid arthritis, I will probably take them off of all grains and all beans, as well as like nightshade vegetables, so like, uh, like peppers and tomatoes and eggplant, things like that, to see how their inflammation does, and then I'll integrate it back in one by one to see how they respond. So the long answer is there's no one diet other than to say a plant-based, generally a plant-based diet, that's right for everyone. And some people do just great on grains and beans, like millet. I eat millet. I don't eat any other grains, but I eat millet. Um, and I'm not gonna take that out of my diet anytime soon. But other people might not do as well on that. So I think it's a very person-dependent thing. I wouldn't leave here saying, I can't eat grains anymore. But I would say, if I'm worried about my brain health, I'll probably take out the gluten and see if I notice something. Bring the okay. oil or coconut oil. So um, actually, I recommend avocado oil, which you can get at Costco now in very big jars. <laughs> um, and secondarily, I'll use probably coconut oil. Olive oil, because it, has, it smokes at a lower temperature, I don't use for cooking. I use for like toppings of salads and things like that. Yeah. There are peptides, I guess, uh, if you're about it, and some yes. of them are you, uh, 
I've heard about it and wanted to take it. I was wondering what you thought about it. Um, okay, so I'm trying to place it. So far. Yeah. Yeah, I don't need to talk a lot about any Right. It sounds like an it sounds like an enzyme, and I'm not, you know, I'm not placing it. It's not coming to my mind as something that there's a lot of strong evidence for. Uh, there may be some on it, um, and and if you would take it as a supplement. Yes. I'd say there's probably other um, nutraceuticals that probably have a little bit more evidence, but to be fair, I, I don't know the evidence on that. So that's a really individual thing. I work with a, an interesting anesthesiologist who recently got into fasting, and he's now eating once a day, and he feels great, better than he ever has. So I think it depends on a lot of things, and I think it's something to experiment. Are you? Is that something that you're experimenting with? And how are you doing it right now? Yeah, I'm not, I've got a small kid, so it's, it's hard to do it. But uh, when I do it, I feel great. Right. So here's a great example. Like, we would never, years ago, we would never have talked about that. We would really want you eating. In fact, we used to say, like, five meals a day, five or six meals a day, right? Now we're back to eating like we do in medicine and say, no, maybe you'll do okay. Did you go directly to that, or did you work your way to that? Oh, I've kind of gone all over the place. I've done some. And then there are some people who feel absolutely miserable on a fast. And those people are probably more carb-dependent than somebody else. So car if carbohydrates are a big part of your diet, you will feel terrible on a fast because you've trained your body to need immediate fuel. Realize carbs, the, the, the one essential thing about carbs, because it's the only thing, fats are essential, proteins are essential, carbs are not. But carbs will be used as fuel, and if you train your body to have a regular fuel supply coming in, then when you withdraw that, it'll take a while for your body to start using other fuel sources, vis-a-vis -vis your fat, primarily. But if you haven't been ingesting a lot of carbs, then you can move over to what you're describing more easily. So it's a stepwise thing. Okay, well, thank you. I'm amazing you all see.